Okay. Uh, thank you, Ganat, for inviting me to this wonderful Nine Star Key seminar. I've enjoyed all of the presentations, and I have a, a slideshow that I'd like to share with you. But just by way of opening, I'd like to say that over the last several years, I've embarked on a special research and writing project involving the spiral of history, which was the great paradigm that Micho introduced over 50 years ago, which looked at our human origins and our long winding spiralic course over the eons up through the last 5,000 years, which we call the spiral of history, and then culminating in what he called the new era of humanity around 2100, uh, just uh, what, a little over 80 years from now. And spiral of history itself ends in 2036. And it's made up of smaller cycles, including the 81 year cycles, of which we are in the culminating stage of the nine fire cycle right now, which began in 1955. And then in 2036, as the spiral ends, a whole new transition era begins, uh, which will last for 81 years. And that is governed by what we call eight soil energy. So I'd like now to share the screen uh, and go into the PowerPoint. And uh, let's look at this here. Can you see that? Yes. Can you see the? Okay, yeah. You so might that... want to double click on the picture and then we'll get it bigger without the side aspects. I'll, I'll move it into the center a little bit here. That's okay. I have my... Alex, you're muted. Yes, thank you, Dita. Let's see what's going on. Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay, so anyway, you can see from the uh, title slide here that Spiral of History. <laughs> begins roughly 3200 BCE and spirals in. There's three twists of the spiral and it goes to 2036. So that's literally 14 years from now. So we'll be looking uh, at the spiral itself, plus then what comes after the spiral. As I said, an 81 year period governed by eight soil uh, energy. Okay, so what will the future be? Utopia or dystopia? Freedom or worldwide surveillance state? Will it be an oppressive, extremely hot, globally warmed world or a green, organic, sustainable one? Will it be a world devastated by Omegacom, the latest variant of the coronavirus? or one of his successors? Or will it be a healthy planet eating a predominantly plant-based diet and people enjoying a lifespan of 90 to 100 or even more years? I'd like to uh, begin with a mini case history that offers, I think, some lessons for us. And I like to look at Cahokia, which was the great greatest uh, city and culture in North America prior to the European arrival. And this is just an artistic illustration of the great mound uh, in southern Illinois, where this uh, society was based. It was one of 120 mounds. It's across from present day uh, St. Louis. And as a child growing up in Illinois, uh, where this complex once existed, I knew nothing about this. It was never taught in the schools. Nobody ever visited it. 
And I never even knew about it until just a few years ago when I was researching uh, for the book Spiral of History. Um, it's at the confluence of the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the Illinois rivers. So it was a riverine-based society and had extensive trade networks throughout North America. Um, at its peak in the 13th century, Cahokia had a population estimated up to 40 to 50,000 people and was larger than London and had very sophisticated uh, technologies, arts, and culture. Okay, the top picture is just a panoramic view, I believe, of the, uh, the ruins of the mound, one of the mounds today. Uh, the map shows its location in the center of the uh, present-day United States or North America on the Mississippi River, which is kind of like the main meridian channel for, for the continent. Um, It was occupied for approximately seven to 800 years between 600 and 1350 and uh, included vast ceremonial plazas, homes for thousands of people. The Great Mound uh, rose 100 feet over the prairie and its base was the same size as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. It was larger than the Pyramid of the Sun in uh, ancient Mexico and was the highest man-made structure in North America until a New York skyscraper exceeded it in the late 19th century. Alex, if we want to play with the sound of the word, we take kihokia, kihokia, sounds kind of like that to me, and we have those sounds in Hebrew. The first syllable ki means like, and hok means the law, law, and ya is God, so it's like, God's law could be a translation. Okay, that's that's good. The actual term Cahokio, interestingly, uh, uh, we don't know what the original name for these people was because they did not have a, a written language and the oral tradition uh, did not survive. But the, a group of Native Americans who moved in subsequently called themselves the Cahokians. So it was a post Cahokian terminology, but that's an interesting interpretation because it is Native American. All right, so as this slide shows, the Cahokians had a highly developed art and culture. Uh, the upper left uh, uh, picture depicts uh, Mother Earth or an, or an Earth Goddess figure. The top right one shows a variety of cups and vessels, and you can see uh, they are inscribed for the most part with spirals. Uh, and then the lower uh, right shows artwork made from copper, uh, which artisans produced a variety of masks, earrings, jewelry, and, and other items and tools, of course. Um, Okay, originally uh, women played the central role in the founding, the growth, and the development of this society, as the mother goddess statue su suggests. And they also served, as they did throughout North America, as the primary farmers. Um, and they cultivated a wide variety of, of foods. Um, this was a little bit unique because in many cultures, farming uh, was ultimately taken over by, by males or by men, but in North America, it was by the women. And uh, spiritual life centered around a figure known as the old woman who never dies. She was an archetypal vegetative or grandmother deity. Uh, for many centuries, the main Food at Kihokia consisted primarily of domesticated cereal grains, uh, of which the main one is upper left, called chinopod or goose foot, foot. It was eaten throughout North America. It was the main grain for thousands of years. Um, and it tastes something like quinoa, of which it is a relative. Uh, though there were several other 
grains that were domesticated, including maygrass, knotweed, and what's called little barley. Wild rice, of course, was also uh, eaten in North America, not only in the Great Lakes region where it is currently found, but literally throughout the continent. So I don't believe it was ever domesticated. Um, but for the most part, North America was a farming society. Um, and when we talk about like the, the, the buffaloes and the Indians and the Great Plains and the hunters, that all came as a response to the cultural genocide in the 18th and 19th centuries. That was a very much later development uh, when the horse was introduced by the Europeans. Before that, it was primarily uh, agricultural societies. Okay, so Cahokia reached a peak in the 12th and the 13th centuries, and its population swelled, its commerce flourished, and it dominated the entire middle of the continent. Uh, historians and anthropologists attribute this dramatic growth in these two centuries to the adoption of maize or corn uh, as, as it had spread from Central America, where it originated. And of course, a similar flourishing uh, developed in Mexico in the Mayan and the Aztec, the Toltec, and other cultures. And it's very interesting that, that maize actually uh, replaced or displaced, you might say, millet, which was the main grain in Central America prior to maize. And also in Cahokia, one of its unique food items was a beverage uh, that anthropologists simply call the black drink that figured in uh, ceremonies. And it was made from the roasted leaves of a particular type of plant called the Yopan holly. And it contains six times as much caffeine as strong coffee. And it is believed to have been used in purification rituals uh, before festivals, battles, and other key events. Its stimulating effect induced sweating, vomiting, purging, and probably hallucinations. With its expanded kernels, maize is the most een of all the grains, and a macrobiotic health care corresponds with fire energy, whose principal organ is the heart. Excessive maize or corn intake was accompanied uh, in uh, South in Central America, as we know, by the cult of human sacrifice and also to some extent among the Incas in South America where maize also uh, spread and began to displace quinoa. And as we know, uh, the hearts were literally plucked from the body of the sacrificial victims uh, in Mexico City and, and in the Mayan uh, areas as well. Um, and in Cahokia, very unfortunately, when maize was introduced, the same uh, pattern evolved that they turned to human sacrifice. And, and uh, this is very interesting from a dietary point of view, because corn as a rule is a very healthy, uh, balanced and even spiritually enlightening grain, but it, in excess, particularly with extreme animal food, can lead to this kind of very negative, dark uh, worldview and appears but that was uh, what happened in Cahokia. So that that original feminist society then was taken over by a patriarchy, which introduced warfare and weaponry on a larger scale, as well as human sacrifice. And then within uh, uh, several generations, the whole uh, civilization collapsed and it was abandoned by the people. Uh, uh, historians and archeologists say that environmental factors played a role for sure, including uh, drought, deforestation, uh, possible flooding and so forth. But they think the main factor was that people voluntarily just moved away because of the strong authoritarian uh, cult um, that had ar arisen and that had resulted to human sacrifice. 
So there are a lot of lessons here because this took place uh, in the uh, early 14th century, which coincides with the very uh, the last 81 year cycle in the spiral of history. So when we're talking about the future, 2036 to 2117, we need to look at the past for lessons to be learned. And this is certainly one of the biggest lessons that um, the delusional ideologies and that kind of uh, um, really violent culture can easily emerge during this era. Yeah, just as a sidelight, I we're talking about the last 81 year cycle. It occurred from 1307 uh, to 1388. And so several other key events during this cycle were number one, this was when exactly when the Black Death broke out, uh, or, or you might say reached its zenith during this period uh, and killed about uh, estimated 30 to 50% in Europe, as well as many parts of Asia and North Africa. Number two, it coincided with the Hundred Years War in Europe, uh, which was one of the most uh, bloody and deadly conflicts in human history. And number three, it coincided with the rise of Tamerlane, the Great, or the Destroyer, who was one of the uh, major genocidal rulers in human history. Over 15 million people died as a direct result of his armies invading from Central Asia to the Middle East and other parts of Europe and Asia. So this was a very, very uh, bloody and deadly era, the last eight year cycle, 81 year cycle. So uh, it's, it's a little bit depressing when we look at this, but we have to be realistic and understand so that we don't repeat history. And as we go forward, we'll just see how we can avert this as uh, this new era uh, dawns. All right, so let's look a little bit more deeply at the uh, spiral of history, which Micho introduced over 50 years ago here. In fact, he's lecturing on it. You may recognize he's looking at the chart of the procession of the equinoxes or the 25,800 year cycle uh, that, as we say, culminates uh, in just 14 years in 2036, as we go through the constellations that move overhead. Uh, right now, the star Polaris is uh, almost directly overhead. And 12 and a half thousand years ago, the constellation of Lyra. Uh, and so uh, the cycle oscillates between these two poles. And traditionally, the, the Vega pole uh, 12 to 13,000 years ago culminates with what was called the destruction by water. And throughout the world, there are great myths about, the, about a great flood or series of floods that engulf the whole world and a small remnant then survive. Uh, today, we're talking about uh, destruction by fire, which is the opposite. And again, we're at the end of a nine fire, 81 year cycle. And so, this kind of fire destruction uh, uh, is on the horizon. So again, we have to avert that in some way. Uh, just to recap, the spiral of history is divided into uh, yin and yang sections. The top part, more rising upward yin energy, has to, is dominated for the most part by ideas, by artistic uh, works, by religion, by uh, more soft, more in, more uh, cerebral and aesthetic types of things. The bottom part is ruled by power, which means more material and scientific and technological advances. The spiral itself then is further divided into 12 sections, beginning there about nine o'clock on the left with origins and then going through uh, sections, including uh, reform, development, control, trade, humanism. Again, this is the cusp of, this is all yang at the bottom, it's more yin at the top. 
uh, idealism, nationalism, internationalism, and it reaches a peak in the 10th house of either war or peace. And then afterward, there's new dimensions and finally a decline. And so there have been three turns of this spiral, three and a half turns, and we're now at the very end of the spiral. We're actually right here on the, um, uh, somewhere on the cusp of nationalism and internationalism and world war, peace, new dimensions. In other words, in the next 14 years, we're going to go through these five sections. Because this is logarithmic, it means that it is now compressed and shortened, whereas when it started in the agrarian age, these sections took hundreds and hundreds of years to go from one to another. And during the Industrial Revolution, the second spiral, it took maybe uh, decades to go from one to another. Now it's a matter of four or five years. It's, everything is now converging. Okay, so that spiral again if, can be divided into three main uh, turns which we can call the agrarian revolution, the industrial revolution, and now uh, the digital revolution. And, uh, and they incorporate then seven major ages, the prehistoric age, the ancient age, the uh, medieval era, and then the modern age, which we can divide after into many sections. And uh, then the, uh, uh, Number uh, five, age of ideology. That means World War One and World War Two, rise of communism, socialism, fascism, capitalism, and then most recently the age of the computer or the digital age. And then parallel with this is what I call the age of sustainability, because we're now bifurcating into two different uh, streams or two different impulses. Okay, and these, I won't go through all these because they're very technical and we don't have time. But again, this is just the first turn of the spiral, which was the, the uh, agricultural revolution in 3200, roughly. Uh, uh, and then up until uh, the end of the Middle Ages, again, the, the Black Death came here in the last section and knocked it out basically that was the end and then it started a new cycle the industrial revolution Oops. which began with the renaissance and then went through the enlightenment american revolution sla slavery and its abolition and up until the 20th century the ideologies cold war space age and then the uh, epidemic of heart disease and cancer actually was the end of that second uh, revolution, the industrial revolution. And then the current revolution is called the digital revolution, which began roughly 1980 with the introduction of the personal computer and robotics, and interestingly with uh, natural foods and macrobiotics. So again, there's two streams now developing here. And we're now somewhere here in, in the, uh, the eighth quad, the eighth hour quadrant, about 10 o'clock, nationalism, where we had uh, President Trump, we had Brexit, we have dictators now emerging throughout the world. We have all kind of nationalistic forces. And, and now we're shading into internationalism with the pandemic uh, though it hasn't been a very united, unified uh, front. But, uh, and then we're moving toward World War Peace, and that can take either a, a, a physical form, or you might say the softer form, which is much more threatening, maybe in the form of artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, Micho had predicted that, that, will, that, that we will be facing the rise of a new species of human being. And, uh, it looks like it won't be so much in the form of bionic people, but more like software intelligence that could conceivably take over the planet in some form or another. Very interesting science fiction becoming reality. 
All right. So this is uh, looking at the precession of the equinoxes, which forms the background to the spiral of history and the coming 81 year cycle and then all future developments. And we see that it begins in the distant past. It's a logarithmic spiral and it goes to 2036. And then it begins, there's a period of, 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 of uh, intermediary period here. This is the 81 year cycle of the 81 year, yeah, the 81 year cycle. And then it begins to spiral in the other direction. So we're in a downward uh, material spiral and this will change to an upward more spiritually oriented spiral. The, and the star Polaris, when it reaches its zenith in 2100, represents the uh, technical moment of change, you might say, though we're right in the middle of it right now. And you can see the one spiral here uh, ends and there's an overlap and the other one begins. And Micho uh, equated that overlap. He said, it's like an Olympic relay race where you have two spirals, you have a, two runners and they're ho each holding the baton. And so one of them lets go at a certain point and the other one takes off. So that's where we are right now. We're, we're, the baton is now being passed to the new emerging spiral, but the old one is still continuing. So we're right there in the center of this whole incredible spiral. Just by way of uh, a footnote, um, I think some of you know that that, as I said, that's, that, that whole spiral of history is based on what's called the precession of the equinoxes. And that's usually explained as a wobble on the Earth's axis pointing to different stars uh, in the North sky. And that was originally conceived by uh, Isaac Newton and by uh, Kepler in the uh, uh, 16th and 17th centuries. Interestingly enough, uh, there may be another explanation for the precession of the equinox. And it's been seriously challenged now by a variety of scientists who believe that uh, the Earth may in fact have a companion star uh, and that they are actually, uh, or at least our sun well, has a companion star and that they are circling each other in such a huge orbit that nobody is aware of it. Though uh, we find traces of this in the mythology, particularly of ancient Egypt, and that star is Sirius, which is the brightest star in the northern sky. And anyway, there's a unique connection between Sirius and ancient Egyptian civilization, as well as the Dogans in uh, West Africa and many other cultures. And a lot of astronomers today believe that actually the procession has nothing to do with the Earth's wobble on its axis, but it has to do with perturbations of this uh, companion cycle. So anyway, that's something to just for people who are aficionados to think about. Also, Micho, when he explained the cycle and these great Earth changes, he talked about uh, a partial axis shift. And again, there's been a lot of change in recent uh, uh, years and, and people are moving away from the axis shift theory to what they call the uh, early driest impact event, which was a giant comet that came into the Earth's atmosphere approximately 12 and a half to 13,000 years ago and can explain uh, those myths of a giant flood and inundations throughout the world and other great Earth changes. There's a lot of geological evidence for this, where there's virtually none for the axis shift theory. So again, Nietzsche may stand corrected on that one. Okay, just a word or two about uh, what I call the five peaceful civilizations. Um, when Nietzsche introduced this bar of history, he said the roots of it were in what he called the ancient scientific and spiritual world community. And he said that had to do with a worldwide uh, one peaceful world civilization that existed uh, 20 to 25,000 years ago, of which there is no archeological evidence. And he equated it with some of the myths of Atlantis, of, of Lemuria or Mu, and the traditions of other cultures and that they had very advanced 
natural technologies, they lived in peace, they spoke a single language and so forth. And, and I loved listening to his, his presentations on, on this subject, but there's really no historical evidence for it. And so when I started working on, on the spiral history books that I've been, that I've been writing, I pretty much left, left it out because it's conjecture, it's speculation. And I'd rather have present something that's based, you know, more or less on, on agreed uh, consensus, whether it's scientific or intellectual or psychological or many other types of looking at reality. But, but what I found, though, in the interim, though, is that there were five historical civilizations that were entirely peaceful and harmonious beginning, uh, uh, at least in my description, I, I singled out the Minoans in uh, Crete and in uh, uh, the Aegean Sea, in the islands of the Aegean Sea, including present day Santorini, which is a completely peaceful and harmonious civilization that lasted for several thousand years. They had, uh, they were a mercantile based society they controlled the trade for grain and olive oil in the Mediterranean and the Aegean. They had beautiful works of art. Uh, it was uh, essentially a feminist society. They had, uh, but they had no rulers. They had no central authority. They had no hierarchies. They had no uh, weapons of war and entirely peaceful. And the only reason they ended was because of a volcanic explosion on Santorini in the year 1600 BCE. And so they sank beneath the waves. In fact, that gave rise to the legend of Atlantis. So it's more likely that Atlantis was based on this than from some actually ancient uh, civilization that was in the Atlantic on a continent wide basis. The other great peaceful civilizations were the Indus Sarasvati Valley in Northwest um, uh, India and Pakistan, the Harappa and the Mohenjo-Daro cultures, which were discovered in the early 20th century, the Niger River Valley uh, civilization in West Africa, uh, the one in uh, the Andes, the Norto Chico, and then finally, the ancestral aboriginals in South America. And the interesting thing is, and I'm sorry, in Australia, the interesting thing is that all five of these civilizations were macrobiotic uh, by any definition. Uh, they were all based on cereal grains. Main grain among the Minoans was barley, secondarily wheat. Among the, the Indians was also barley, uh, was a little bit of wheat. Uh, in West Africa, main grain was brown rice with some millet, uh, secondary, and in Nordo Chico, main grain was quinoa. And among the uh, aboriginals in Australia, the main grains were uh, rice and millet. They did not have uh, cultivated agriculture. They had a very beautiful system of natural agriculture in which they nourished the growing of wild foods of which then rice was the number one grain. Very interesting. All five of these civilizations, again, existed for, for over a thousand years. Um, and with no warfare, no weapons, no hierarchies, no royalty, no religion, no priest, no priestesses, amazing. So it shows that human beings can live in a natural way and conversely, what I call the eight uh, warlike civilizations are the ones that we read about in the history books in which we're brought up with, beginning with Mesopotamia, the Sumerians, leading to the Hittites, the Babylonians, and many others, ancient Egypt, uh, ancient Israel, uh, China, Vedic India, uh, Greece, Rome, uh, Maya, Aztec and the Inca, all these civilizations, you know, they had many wonderful artistic, aesthetic uh, contributions, but at heart, they are all patriarchal, 
They were all based on slavery. They all had a uh, tremendous amount of violence and warfare, all eight of these. So uh, the very clear contrast to the five peaceful civilizations uh, that I just mentioned. All right, so the uh, world is now <clears throat> accelerating uh, with a spiral of history. It's a young contractive spiral. Alex, and as were, we those, reach, were those eight warlike civilizations not grain-based? Uh, they were grain-based, but again, we can, yeah, I don't want to get into a side lecture, but they, yes, they were grain, they were all grain-based, but they were based on plow-based farming. Uh, this is very interesting because when you get, yeah, this is worth saying because when you introduce the plow, uh, yeah, this was a key moment in human history. I think it was the pivotal moment because what happened was that with plow, it eventually became uh, uh, animal based, pull, pulling the plows. And so at that point, the men took over the plowing from the women. And because of their, their they had better upper body strength. They were much stronger so they could handle the animals and they could pull the plows much better than women. So at that point, the women lost control of the food supply in these eight uh, civilizations. And from that point, patriarchy emerged. It's really fascinating to see. Up until that point, and of course, what we call hunter-gatherer society, women controlled the food supply totally. You know, 75 to 80 percent of all the food in hunting cultures is plant-based, and it's gathered by women. And the, and the animal food is is very small minority part of the diet, very intermittent, and uh, they were for the most part they're almost all feminist societies, egalitarian societies. All right. So as we enter the center of the spiral right now. Uh, Things are becoming much more yang. Those are just some of the qualities of yang as we enter into the center of the spiral. High energy, high speed, high temperature, density, pressure, production, consumption, efficiency, high caloric, high protein diets, fast circulation of people and money, short attention spans. Anyway, those are just some of the factors. Uh, and so during this last 81 year fire cycle, fire now energy has emerged. And so these are just some of its manifestations uh, in which the world could end. One is through nuclear war or accident or just uh, nuclear radiation. Artificial electromagnetic energy is also a nine fire phenomena, which is certainly spreading uh, greatly. Uh, global warming, course is a nine fire event, uh, vanishing nutrients, uh, new epidemics, biological degeneration, cyber war, loss of biodiversity, genetic engineering, GMO foods, new synthetic species. Anyways, we're living in a really the, the world is on fire as that illustration shows. Okay, now this is pretty interesting. If we look at um, the world today, in the next 14 years, the next uh, 50, 75 years, we move into the eighth soil era. Uh, we can see these are so-called global hotspots, but the main superpowers in the world today are the United States, uh, Russia, and China. And this is very interesting uh, because uh, when we look at the dynamics of these three great powers, and we look at their nine star key energies, uh, each, each of these countries resonates with a particular energy. And the United States, traditionally, it has been wheat. Uh, I'm sorry, it's been three tree, uh, because the, the main grain is wheat, which is a three tree grain. And so the United States uh, is a three tree country has been linked with, it's the beginning of the cycle, right? Beginning of morning, beginning of spring. So it's, so it's innovation, it's inventive, it's uh, very uh, crusading, like David just said in his lecture about three tree, right? They're always trying to save or rescue people. Uh, they're always on the cutting edge of idealism. So that's America, three tree, traditionally. 
Russia, conversely, is a one water country. Uh, it's wintry, it's cold. Its main grain is buckwheat, which is a one water grain. And uh, so that's uh, uh, Russia, former Soviet Union. Number uh, China, China, sorry, I'm having technical problems. Okay, China is traditionally a number five country. It's in, you know, it's the middle kingdom. That's what they called themselves. They were in the middle. And their main grain traditionally in China is millet, which is a five soil grain. Rice is eaten in China, but it's peripheral uh, historically and even today. It's mostly eaten in the South China. It's not the main grain. So it's a number five uh, country. So those are very interesting dynamics. Three, one, and five. But wait, there's been a big change. And the big change has to do <laughs> with the United States because wheat is no longer the number one grain in the United States. Anybody know what the main grain is today? Corn, corn. Corn, very good. Corn has emerged uh, over the last uh, several decades as the number one grain. And if you think about it, corn has emerged in the form of GMO corn, right? Something like 95% of all the corn or maize in the United States now is GMO. And it's consumed not primarily as sweet corn, you know, for 4th of July or, or when you're making polenta, but it's consumed in the form of, uh, number one is high fructose corn syrup, right? Which has replaced sugar. Sugar is, you know, is, has been widely re replaced now. Uh, it's the main sweetener by high fructose corn syrup, which is a very unhealthy type of, of, of uh, processed food that was developed in Japan uh, about a generation ago and has now pretty much conquered the world. Uh, also corn uh, and then corn or corn products and oil from GMO corn is used in processed foods. 87% of all foods in the supermarket contain either processed soy or corn that is genetically uh, engineered. So, and then thirdly, uh, corn or maize in the United States is consumed not only by people, but it's consumed by motor vehicles, right? By cars, trucks, and other vehicles in the form of ethanol, right? 10% of all the petroleum or at least gasoline products contain corn. So corn has emerged as the number one grain in the United States. So the United States has now become an, a number nine fire country over the last generation. It's, wheat is no longer uh, governing, but corn is governing. And so again, the internet, entertainment, space, travel, high, fast, loud, that all those kind of number nine uh, energy vibrations now govern Amer America or, or the United States. And so if you look at the dynamics, what number controls nine fire? One water, right? And the one water country is Russia. And we're seeing that right now playing out as Russia makes its move on Ukraine. It's so interesting to see how that dynamic is there. And, um, and we'll have to see where, where, where China fits in as, as the decades continue to unfold. But again, China is, is a five soil country and it tends to monopolize. And so it clearly has plans for world domination. It's a uh, belt and, and energy initiative you know, is now in 190 countries or something. And uh, it's very likely or very, it, it intends to take over the world in a, certainly in a peaceful way if it can, but 
it's not adverse as we've seen in Hong Kong or, or among the uh, Asian populations to use violence and coercion. So anyway, it's a very violent, potentially violent world right now. Okay, so this slide just summarizes how corn, high fructose corn syrup and ethanol have really much taken over uh, and are now governing, at least in the United States. All right, so let's go back to the number eight soil cycle. And the original cycle that I presented of the 14th century was pretty, pretty pessimistic if we look at what happened in terms of the Black Death, the Hundred Years War, uh, Tamerlane the Great, and all the other catastrophes. So the question is, will we repeat that kind of cycle, energy, and vibration? Or is there another, another path possible? Well, if we go back to the previous uh, eight soil cycle, 729 years previous to that, meaning nine times nine, 81 year cycles, we come to the years 578 to 659. And it's true that it, it followed the collapse of the Roman Empire uh, in the previous nine energy cycle. Remember in the late uh, 400s, uh, Rome began to collapse. It took several centuries to totally collapse in the West. But in the new eight soil cycle, three golden ages emerged. Uh, one was in India, here at the lower right, under the uh, great emperor Harsha. Harsha was a, uh, the leader of a great empire in North India, conquered all of his opponents, and then he had a, a great change of heart, and he became a Buddhist, and he became a vegetarian, and he pretty much abolished uh, animal food eating uh, throughout India, and he, and he created a golden age uh, of art, culture, literature. He wrote plays in Sanskrit. There were great travelers from all around the world that came. He set up universities. Anyway, it's the biggest golden age in Indian history. Uh, same thing in China. This cycle coincided with the rise of the Tang Dynasty. Of course, there have been many uh, great dynasties in China, but the Tang Dynasty is widely considered to be the greatest one, and its artistic and cultural achievements have never been equal. And it began, it actually continued for an, an well into the next era, but uh, throughout the, that eight soil. And then finally, this coincides with uh, Muhammad and the rise of Islam. Remember in the early uh, 600s, Muhammad, uh, brought together the rival tribes and communities in Arabia and gave rise to Islam, which then evolved into one of the greatest civilizations and movements in world history. And, and its preservation of science, literature, and the arts is unequaled uh, uh, with Europe. Uh, it also was a bastion for the most part of religious toleration for many, many centuries. and. Uh, it tended to respect the Christians and, and Jewish people communities under its embrace. Uh, and, after, and for example, after the Inquisition in Europe, many of the Jews ended up settling uh, and found refuge uh, with the Muslims. Um, so anyway, these were three golden eras that evolved, began, and really flourished, beginning in an eight soil cycle. So what I think this tells us is that we have a choice of futures. It, the coming eight cycle does not have to be negative, uh, pessimistic, and destructive, but it can actually be very bright and lead to a flourishing of culture and civilization. And in fact, these were the two charts that Micho uh, created uh, a generation ago. And in fact, I worked with him, with, we did this for the One Peaceful World book in the early 1980s. And, and I remember we stayed up late one night, we literally stayed up all night working on, because his original chart went to 1980. And I said, well, what's going to happen afterward? So he said, well, there are two possibilities. So we sat down and we, we sketched them all out and I took notes. And anyway, 
one is very dark and one is very bright. So he says that's the way it is because we're in that changing moment right now where there are two spirals and, and the modern civilization is collapsing and the new one is, is now emerging. Okay, so these are just some of the uh, kind of key vibrations that, that at least the more upward lighter spiral uh, is manifesting, including and beginning with the foundation of natural and organic agriculture and food, and of course, green energy, appropriate technology in many different forms, sexual and gender equality, racial and social justice, abolition of nuclear weapons and energy, ultimately leading to planetary commonwealth, the unified world, and a new spiritual orientation to life. Okay, the foundation then is, uh, as we know in the macrobiotic community, is food. And uh, this is a chart that I developed for the Spiral of History books. Actually, I don't have time to go into it, but it shows that what we call standard macrobiotic diet that Micho and Aveline then uh, developed uh, in Boston in the 1970s actually is based on the golden spiral and has proportions based on the spiralic understanding of nature and it's totally deep fascinating study and i'll just throw it out there without going into detail i could go to a whole lecture on it but the proportions are purely spiralic okay i think a key to the future uh whether it's right now or 14 years from now or a century from now and in the future is eating what we call on cereal grains and ons are those long bristles or hairs at the ends of the uh, growing grain in the fields. And Micho had always taught that these long uh, bristles gather serve as antenna to gather in energy from the cosmos so that those kind of vibrations uh, from the different constellations and far distant galaxies and so forth. They come streaming in and charge us when we eat food, when we eat grain that has these long bristles. And about five years ago, uh, with my colleagues, Bettina Zundek and Edward Esco, after the Cushy Institute ended, when we were reassembling and starting our new activities under planetary health, uh, we simultaneously discovered that our uh, that the brown rice that we were eating here in the United States was not on. We had assumed that it had these long bristles and that we were getting this charge of cosmic energy. And then we discovered, no, that virtually all of the rice that's commercially grown in the United States, as well as in China, Japan, India, and most other countries is onless. It has no odds because uh, for a variety of reasons, over the last several thousand years, the, the, the rice with the odds uh, gave smaller yields and, and it cost more in time and labor and so forth for farmers. So they selected it out and they grew the onless varieties. So very unfortunately, the rice crop throughout the world is an onless rice crop. Though there are indigenous strains here and there that have been preserved by small groups of people, uh, most notably by the African people, uh, including when they came to the United States as slaves, they brought with them on grains, which they grew themselves, and which has been a key to their survival and flourishing. They were, one of, they were the main community that protected the brown rice. Um, but here and there, farmers are now growing on rice. So that we've been promoting that for the last five years. But meanwhile, you can eat on barley and wheat. All, virtually all of the wheat and barley in the world today is still on. It has a totally different uh, physical structure than rice. And so it gives higher yields and so farmers have continued to grow those varieties for thousands of years. So that's something 
uh, one of our great discoveries. So food is uh, essential for the foundation. And I'll just conclude uh, my presentation with a dream that I had. Uh, it was a couple years ago. And in the dream, I was giving a consultation to an old woman in the hospital, as portrayed in this cartoon that I found on the internet, this clip art drawing. And she was hooked up to all these, uh, you know, IVs and different things, and for blood transfusions or whatever. And there was a, at the foot of the bed, just like in the drawing, there was a clipboard as in a, you know, many hospitals, and I picked it up. And I saw that her name was listed at the top. And her name was Mrs. Aska, A-S-K-A. -A. And when I saw that in the dream, I immediately knew who she was. Because Aska was a name that Micho had taught us in spiritual training seminars over the years. He said Aska was the name, uh, was the ancient name uh, for the peaceful uh, world community on this planet thousands and tens of thousands of years ago. And it had survived in a number of place names, such as Alaska or Nebraska or Madagascar. And there are many temples and other places that preserve that meaning, Aska. So when I saw that on the chart in the dream, I knew immediately who she was, that this woman was Mother Earth and that she was ailing, she was on life support because of all of the destruction and pollution and abuse and misuse over the, over the centuries. So, so in the dream, I had the privilege of giving her a consultation in which the number one thing I said was, well, you really have to eat grains every day, including on cereal grains. <laughs> so that was the foundation of the consultation that I gave her. <laughs> and then I awoke at that point. So hopefully she's on the mend. All right, just one final uh, slide. This is the uh, um, part of the uh, next constellations that are going to arise in the night sky over the next few centuries including uh, Cephas, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, and Pegasus. So I strongly encourage you to read about these constellations in Greek mythology, and as well as in other cultures and traditions, because they will move overhead and the stories behind them will give us a clue to the kinds of challenges that humanity will face in the centuries ahead. We can learn a lot from these stories. So please look at them and try to figure out, see if they can help guide us through the challenging period ahead. Okay, so that ends my, my uh, presentation. Uh, this is one of our websites, planetaryhealth.com. Some of the books that I mentioned are available here. Uh, Barrel of History. I have four volumes out now and working on the fifth. We have three volumes of the Golden Dream Cookbook with Bettina's recipes, which are a companion to that. One Peaceful World Cookbook that I wrote with uh, Sachi Kato and then Micho, Remembering Micho, Anthology of Reminiscences by many of his students and relatives and colleagues. And there are many, there are another 20 books who, that are available from our site. Also, we'll be doing the summer conference here in the Berkshires again after the Cushy Institute closed. We started up the conference under the Planetary Health banner. Probably it'll be again online because of the COVID situation. Uh, dates will be announced shortly, uh, but it'll probably be about five days of uh, presentations, including many cooking classes, panels, yoga, um, we give an annual peace prize to someone in the macrobiotic community for their outstanding contribution to, uh, to health and uh, sustainability and peace. So we welcome your participation. Okay, sorry I ran over a little bit on my time. 
Alex, this was a, a tremendous presentation. I am just so grateful to you. To be able to, to find patterns in history is know from where you came, know from to where you're going. I'm, I'm so grateful to you, Alex, for your time and your wisdom, your understanding. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, I have a question if um, no one else does or to start it off. Um, you talked about that you hope that there won't be nuclear weapons, of course, and nuclear energy. Uh, why not nuclear energy? Yeah, the problem with, with nuclear energy is nuclear waste, because nuclear energy produces uh, a, a huge volume of, depending on what type, cesium, uranium, uh, and other types of radioactive materials for which there is no permanent solution. See, the best solution we have right now for nuclear waste are salt mines, right? The salt is stable, salt is young, compared to radiation, which is extremely in. But like in Fukushima, uh, they were, uh, the nuclear accident there that destroyed uh, the reactors and so forth. See, those were, those were just held in containers uh, above ground. But even if you put it in the salt mines, uh, the salt will, will shift because of earthquakes and earth changes over thousands of years. So what the scientists tell us is that salt mines will inevitably break down and any, any radioactive material will be released. And there are literally millions of tons of radioactive material whose half-lives are in the millions of years. One is in the billions. And until that, that is protected, our future, our generations of children and people to come could very easily be wiped out by, by this radiation if it's released. So to, to, so to use nuclear energy is, is the most foolish, short-sighted type of pollution on the planet. It's imperiling future generations. Now, the, the solution to this, however, is, is very interesting. And the solution is a macrobiotic solution. And that is to, to because you can't, you can't, you can't uh, protect the radiation by containing it, you know, in any kind of, of facility or concrete bunker or whatever it might be, or a salt mine. So the, you have to think out of the box. And, the, and, and that thinking involves changing the nuclear waste itself. In other words, transforming or what we call transmuting it into non-nuclear waste or even something that can be useful. And so that's where the theory of transmutation comes in, which is what George Osawa was working on at the time of his death, in which he'd introduced and, uh, and Micho and he had collaborated on some very basic experiments to transform uh, initially sodium into potassium and then carbon into iron. And that uh, introduced the theory that our ordinary elements can be transmuted at low pressures and temperatures into other elements. This goes against the current scientific par paradigm. It's considered impossible. It can only be done according to scientists under uh, stellar conditions or, or during the so-called Big Bang at the beginning of the universe. So they don't accept the theory at all, but, but Osawa showed it in some simple tabletop experiments. And then over the last decade uh, uh, with my colleagues Edward Esco and, and Woody Johnson, we started a little company called Quantum Rabbit in which we have been recreating these experiments. And we've now actually expanded them into about 20 different types of elements that we've created in, in vacuum tubes, including all of the industrial elements and, um, uh, and things like titanium, you know, which is quickly now replacing steel as the number one industrial metal. And so this is a very simple way. And, and at the end of his life, Edward Esco, our, our dear colleague who recently passed away was was working on the, what we call the reme nuclear remediation 
of transforming nuclear waste into a stable, safe type of elements, see, that would protect humanity in the future. So that's a totally macrobiotic project. Thank you. I'll just mention that as a young student of Michaud in 1980, 82, um, I, developed a spiral of Jewish history, looking at all the way from Abraham and taking all or much of Jewish history and ap applying it turn, uh, into the, the model of the uh, spiral of history. So that was an interesting project. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, I, I was just uh, at Abraham's birthplace a couple months ago. In Turkey. <laughs> yeah. In Turkey. yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, a very special place. Yeah. Well, Christine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, any other questions? This is quite an opportunity. Unmute, Miriam. You could talk. Unmute yourself. Trying. Okay, there we go. So, uh, just to address what you were saying about nuclear energy, we have a big problem with that here in West Texas, where they're trying to bring all the nuclear waste from the United States here, basically the high level nuclear waste. So we've been very active here in Texas to fight against that. And one of the things to note is that it takes more energy to create nuclear power than you actually get from a nuclear reactor. And, and you're digging out uranium from the mines, which creates radioactive and cancers all around it. And the, and the nuclear reactors leak even when they don't have meltdowns. So this is, to my way of thinking, the most dangerous, even though it's invisible, it's the most dangerous thing we are doing on this planet right now is having nuclear energy. So, yeah, I, I would agree entirely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. A personal question: When you, a, what success do you have in communicating your ideas to people who are close to you, like family, neighbors, friends? And what do you serve at dinners when you host people? Do you, you know, do you? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's hard for me to judge what the reaction is, but I think generally very positive, you know, that, that again, we're moving into a, a new era and our ideas are now being more widely accepted by the mainstream. And my, it's very clear that the planet is moving in a vegan plant-based direction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Within, you know, a few years, animal food is going to be prohibitively expensive for most people. You know, it would be once a month or once a week. It's clearly moving in that direction. Uh, the, my biggest concern though, is that whether the, whether it's going, the, the vegan movement is going to emerge as a high tech vegan movement or, or what we might say is a more natural sustainable movement because all of the, you know, these uh, uh, internet tycoons are now putting a lot of money into high-tech GMO vegan foods uh, and that kind of thing. Right. So that's, that's a danger. Uh, and they're going to do it in the name of climate change and global warming. And the same thing with electrification of the planet. You know, the whole planet is now being electrified. They're getting rid of gas cooking here in the United States uh, in the name of climate change. Mm. And, and cooking with electric, I think most of us know, is, is not healthy. And uh, same thing with riding in electric vehicles. Uh, in principle, of course, it's good because it's going to reduce climate change, but it's going to weaken our immunity. It's going to, many people are very sensitive to electric fields. It's a disaster, basically, on wheels, you might say. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of, of, of stuff that's moving forward, you know, for a good cause, but, but it's not well understood or thought out. So I think we have to come up with alternatives. Alex, have you ever tried to present uh, any of yours and Edesco's ideas and 
uh, books and things to uh, Mensa International? Not to Mensa, and no, we're no, not not per se. But I must say, uh, we have been writing uh, for for a magazine called Infinite Energy, which is an alternative science magazine, which is on the cutting edge, you know, of of green energy, new energy, and new scientific paradigms. And when Ed passed away, they they published a little uh, editorial or a comment in which they hailed him as one of the great pioneers uh, of today because they said there are so many people, so many groups are actually thinking about new energy sources, including what came to be known as cold fusion. Uh, but they say almost none of them came up with any practical results. And they said our group was the only one that came up with something practical because we, we were very carefully tested everything and we had outside independent labs you know, verify all of our results. So anyway, he was singled out really as one of the great pioneers. So hopefully this will be built on by, by other people and companies. In fact, we were contacted by a, uh, uh, a large firm that actually, they had the largest, they were the largest supplier to the DOD, uh, Department of Defense in the United States for the concrete bunkers which they kept nuclear waste at the present time. And they said, we heard about you. They said, you'll put us out of business if there's anything to it. But we said, they said, we'd rather go out of business than, you know, because we, they said, we, we know that our concrete bunkers, you know, won't last more than a few centuries. And the salt mines, you know, maybe a few thousand years. So they said, we support exactly what you're doing. So that idea, those ideas are out there now and, and hopefully will be picked up by other scientists. Patricia Becker. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Alex and Bernard and everyone. Um, I was wondering when you were talking about the rice, is the godo rice any better with the long tentacles? Yeah, I'm not sure about coda. I, I'm, I'm not positive. I don't think they have one, but I really don't know for sure. Okay, thank you. I think it's good rice, like Lundberg rice. I mean, these are all good rice for health and vitality, the brown rice that we're eating. It's just that, that, that the awns give a, a higher charge for more spiritual development. How do you spell that, awns? A-W-N. A-W-N. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, so you say barley and... Wheat. Um, wheat. Wheat. Yeah, they well, are all, not, for the most part, they're all on, yes. What yeah. about Tef? Tef, I guess a good question. I believe, I'm pretty sure it probably is. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, millet has small ons. I think quinoa has smaller ons. The tassels on, on corn actually serve the same function, though they're softer form of it. Yeah, it's yeah. very unfortunate that rice, because it has a very different chemical structure than the other grains, that it lost its ons because of human intervention. But there are now a group of farmers here in New England that are growing on rice, but not commercially. So just for their own use or for, you know, we use it in our program sometime to serve it to people just to give them an idea. But hopefully some larger commercial farmers will pick up on it because the seeds are available. And so we've been growing a little bit here in our backyard and other people have. So it's really beautiful, wonderful rice. Where can we get the seeds from? Uh, from, well, just Planetary Health. You can contact me through through my website or, or um, I can give you uh, my email address in the chat. Okay. So then if we don't right. have more questions, uh, Patricia, I'm going to mute you. Just give us all the, uh, the email address. So Alex, again. Here's some of the rice right here. This is what we grew in the back. You can see it. I don't know if you can see the long, thin, has awns on it. 
They're very fine. Oh yeah. Fine hairs. But they're very prominent in wheat and barley, in rye, in oats, yeah. Alex, once again, great thanks to you. I, I so appreciate you and your work, and I really am. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alex. Yeah, yeah thank very you. enthusiastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.